the traditional. Great, as I said, it's a, a real pleasure to be here today, uh, joining you from Treaty 6 territory, traditional homeland of the Métis. And while I always want to acknowledge and recognize the ancestors of the lands, for me, it's particularly important to also recognize the waters that are the lifebloods of us as individuals, but also our communities, societies, and that connect us. And so I want to pay respect not only to the um, First Nations and Métis ancestors of the Saskatoon region for the land stewardship, but also for the water stewardship over the generations. And so today I'm going to chat with you a little bit about intersectionality and water security and with it a little bit of my journey, I suppose, in the water, uh, water research space. So why don't I start by setting the stage? I know we're a, a diverse audience. And so I just wanted us to sort of start with some basic premises that I, I know that we all know and understand. And that is that water affects our health and it affects our health in terms of the quality, the quantity, uh, accessibility, and also from extremes, uh, droughts and floods. And what isn't here in the World Health Organization summary of uh, deaths and uh, daily adjusted life year burden of disease is that mental health burden that I think is becoming more and more uh, recognized as we see floods, droughts, wildfires um, in many parts of the world. And so just want to recognize that there is a substantial burden of uh, health burden associated with and attributed to water in all of its forms. And one of the reasons why WASH and, and WASH Talks and uh, the CREATE program exists is because we know that drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, hygiene, uh, household hygiene, personal hygiene, hand washing hygiene, all interrupt that transmission of infectious diseases in particular. And so WASH, is important and just a, a few of the areas where I've been doing some of the research that I do. And when I say I, I actually mean we. And so I just want to recognize the uh, other researchers, uh, community leaders, uh, community members, as well as the graduate and undergraduate students that have I've had the privilege and the pleasure to work with over many, many years now, uh, both in Canada and in East Africa. And so when we think about WASH and we think about some of the technologies, rainwater harvesting, it's something that was really near and dear to the late uh, Honorable Maria Mutagamba, who was the Minister of Water and Environment for Uganda. And her vision was to have a rainwater harvesting system in every house. And some of the work that we've been doing, we've uh, worked with not-for-profits and with healthcare facilities to put rainwater harvesting in place. And it really does augment supply. And the reality is that when you have water in healthcare facilities, then you actually have the ability to clean. You have the ability for hygiene. And so you end up with, with pride and with um, the nurses in the maternity ward in Kaula Hospital actually won an award for the cleanliness of the ward once the uh, rainwater harvesting system was in place. Uh, but what we've also found out, and we developed a an online sort of uh, Excel-based tool to be able to configure rainwater harvesting systems, is that in many, many instances, rainwater harvesting might be necessary, but it's also insufficient. And so we really, it does depend on the roof size for the catchment. It depends on the storage tank. And so um, sort of, a 10,000 litre storage tank is what you need to be thinking about to be able to even start meeting some of those, approximating some of the demands that you have. And depending on the length of the dry season or in Canada, the uh, the cold season where everything's frozen up and you don't have rain falling, then rainwater, um, that storage becomes particularly important and is not sufficient to be able to carry you through those longer periods. And, and this is even just looking at it from a 20 litre per person per day, which of course is is the minimum. And so um, 
we also have in the work that we've been doing looked at and had youth engagement in, for example, sanitation. And this is something that was done uh, through University of Waterloo and uh, in a community in Kenya where we undertook a baseline study to identify some of the needs and found out that youth were, were really frowned upon and were blamed for a lot of the problems. And so we engaged youth in training them on the manufacturing of a new interlocking brick, which reduces the amount of cement that's needed. And also they provided the labor for the bricks to be manufactured for the for the sanitation block. And so that again, held them up a little bit more in the community and gave them a different vocation, a different employment opportunity. And so I'll come back to this later, but I believe that these connections and the linkages are really, really important. And so it's not sufficient to just go in and sort of put in a, a sanitation facility or put in a, a water point. We really have to think about it in the context of the community, the community needs, but also how we can support the community in other ways. Uh, also looked at some of the water treatment technologies and particularly biosand filters and the uh, plastic versus cement biosand filters uh, linked with, with KAUST out of Alberta, and then ceramic filters and nanosilver particles and whether we can replace the, the nanosilver with copper or other um, metals to be able to still get that uh, antimicrobial and levels of, of water treatment. Also have looked at sanitation, and again, not just in terms of wastewater treatment, but so anaerobic digestion works in terms of a wastewater treatment. It's something that you can do um, at the pseudo household level. If you have uh, particularly um, several heads of cattle, then you can start thinking about anaerobic digestion um, from a, a human waste perspective, then schools and several households together or a healthcare facility the anaerobic digestion becomes feasible in terms of dealing with the waste. But what we wanted to look at again in this context of it's not just sanitation, it's not just drinking water, is the sort of whole system. And actually, if we start thinking about sanitation and if we start thinking about the waste products as a resource, then we can start thinking about financing. And the studies that we did under this uh, Rising Stars in Global Health Grand Challenges Canada Award were to look at different scenarios and found that returns on investment, even if you consider oh, um, operation and maintenance ongoing, you can still pay some of these back in less than a year. And for some of the larger systems, it was less than four years. And so there's a real incentive and an opportunity for investment, either microfinance or larger finance investment in these types of situations where the byproducts and the value in those byproducts can be used as sort of security against that upfront financing cost that's required. And it's again, it's not just about the um, the the money that's generated. Uh, it's about the economic growth that's generated, which is the black boxes. Uh, the green is the environmental benefits and the pink is the health benefits. And so, again, thinking about the different parts of this and the different elements that WASH touches upon and that our WASH solutions can support in terms of that broader uh, sustainable development context. We also recognize that perceptions become important in terms of when people are going to use water treatment, when people are going to use um, a sanitation facility versus business as usual. And uh, for me, this is, this is critical because perceptions are reality. And so when we're thinking about that, it really is... Um, very much around if people have a perception that is their reality and that might prevent them from the protective behaviors that we would want them to to take on board i remember being at a, a workshop um and uh i'm trying to think where it was but the workshop was you thought smoking giving up smoking was hard you should try getting people to use a toilet and again, it's all about that social marketing and the fact that um, 
there has to be a hook. Um, they have to, we have to be able to change perceptions. And this is an example. This is actually from Kenya, but we've used similar surveys in other communities, baseline surveys in other communities in other countries. And it's remarkably similar in terms of the perceptions that if water is clear, then it's good to drink. And of course, that negates the possibility of there being uh, microbial contamination. And also then... Um, some of the perceptions can actually reinforce. So, for example, this cold, wet weather, our immediate reaction might be actually, no, it isn't. But we do know that um, in East Africa, that cold, wet weather is associated with rainfall, and rainfall is associated with the washing off of pathogens into water bodies. And so when we think about it, actually, that cold, wet weather is an indicator of waterborne disease in some contexts. And so even if the perception and the sort of the scientific link might not be there, um, it still reinforces that positive behavior. So again, do those perceptions, do they need to be changed or are they reinforcing a positive behavior? And so it's not necessarily as important as if they're reinforcing a negative behavior. I don't want you to think that all of this is just applicable to low and middle income countries um, or even to First Nation communities, but this is a study on long term drinking water advisories and their impacts. And I just want to recognize that impacts again, we've seen the health impacts. I opened with that and we know about um, the mental health impacts as well, but we don't necessarily think about some of the financial impacts. We don't think about some of the uh, physical and time impacts or the psychological and spiritual impacts of not having water, whether that's because there is no water because the water is of poor quality. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, and so this was a, an Anishinaabe community in Ontario, and we found very much that people were sharing that declining water quality is affecting the values um, that people hold and also their relationships with water. And Indigenous peoples have um, values that are that are different from non-Indigenous peoples. And so um, water having life, water having spirit. And we need to recognize the values that different groups have around water. And we can't just be imposing solutions that fit for one group on groups that have other values. And again, this comes back to my conversation in a, a little bit about intersectionality. But you can see that um, the financial, physical time impacts were significant. Um, the More than half of the people reported psychological and spiritual impacts, um, but social impacts weren't quite as significant. And you can see we asked people how it made them feel. And I want to draw your attention to the top, to the people who felt that they were happy, who reported that they were happy um, when there was a long-term drinking water advisory. And that might seem counterintuitive, but when we were asking and having the conversations with elders, with chief and council, and with the, the people that we interviewed, they were happy because it meant that something would be done. They were happy because it was drawing attention to it. They were happy because it meant that somebody somewhere had to find a solution to the challenges and the predicament that they were in. And so, again, just recognizing um, that sometimes formal recognition of challenges can be really beneficial um, as long as they're then dealt with and, uh, and responded to. But we have to have those, those actions that follow up afterwards. So I think I've started giving you a, a few hints as to why I shifted from that wash focus to a coupled systems approach and a local water security appro approach. And I believe that both fit with the sustainable development goals and uh, 2030 agenda. But for me, it became very real. I was in a community in East Africa and supporting a women's group. Uh, they had uh, put a... Um, solar panel up and a a water point and a pump to because they had a foot pump and it was a 50 meter borehole and there was a HIV AIDS missing generation and the grandmothers couldn't physically pump the water up and so they were having real challenges even though water was there it wasn't accessible and the 
the conversations we, as I say, put the solar pump in and put some storage locations in so that they could feed it the water by gravity down to some key places. They eventually wanted it down into the valley in the maternity ward. And when we went back to visit to see how they were doing, um, some men in the community started talking about a pineapple juicing plant and how now that there was water and it was easily accessible, they were going to use it for a pineapple juicing plant because that would provide an economy in the community and it would also raise their political profile and that they could move up in the political standings. And it struck me then that really we have to have a whole of community approach. We cannot think about WASH in and of itself because otherwise, once we do, it may not stay like that um, in a community. That water may be taken and used for other purposes. Um, and also, you can't necessarily maintain WASH systems and infrastructure if you don't have economy, if you don't have money in the system. And you can't stay healthy even with WASH if you don't have food security and, and proper nutrition and nutrition diversity, dietary diversity. And so we started thinking about local water security and what that might look like. And so you can see here, this has gone through many iterations from sort of uh, 2013, 2014, right up until 2023. But I just want to draw your attention to a little bit. And the first is that at the top, there are the context pieces, right? It's about the history. Um, it's about the future. It's about change, environmental, economic, social change, uh, climate change. And it's also about all of the dimensions of water. If you come down to the bottom in terms of it's the natural res water resource, it's the infrastructure, um, it's the food, it's the economy, and it's uh, the environmental flows and the ecosystem services. But you'll see those darker blocks boxes because it's also about community, it's about health and well-being, and it's about equity. And we, as I say, have gone through several iterations with different communities, different groups, but it was our conversations with First Nation communities that put that outer ring around this. And the you can see the governance and the constitution versus the rights and the responsibilities. And this comes back to that notion of stewardship and the fact that, yes, we absolutely should be able to claim our rights around water, and many, many people can't and, and aren't afforded that opportunity. But we also have a responsibility, and that those rights come with responsibilities. And I think that many of us who have the right to water, who don't necessarily think about the right to water, who turn a tap on and, and don't necessarily wonder whether it will run for as long as we need it to, um, or whether uh, somebody 30 kilometers down the road may not have a tap that they can turn on in their house. They may actually have to go and use a tanker and fill up a well. Um, so all of those things, and there are a lot of us that take this for granted. And so my work, uh, and the work of my colleagues has really focused more on that rural, remote, marginalized, um, but also bringing indigenous uh, values um, and, and shared with us uh, as part of this framing. And we've been taking it then because if you can't measure, you can't know. And if you don't know, you can't understand. And so, again, tying that into the variables and indicators for assessment to be able to think about what local water security means across all of these dimensions. And it doesn't mean that every project will focus on every element of this. And in fact, they probably won't. But that's where this coupled systems approach comes in, in terms of at least we can understand the elements we're focusing on and the elements that we're not focusing on. And for me, this becomes important then because if we're honing in on an area, if we're looking at wash, um, what if our levers are outside that, that wash part of the, the community? Or if we're thinking about food security, what if the levers are actually in the, the hygiene space? And so again, that coupled systems, local water security framing becomes really useful for us to be able to understand where we are intervening 
where we could intervene and and if perhaps our interventions aren't working then what what could those levers be outside of the perspective that we've taken and the scope that we've taken. And I fully recognize there are financial limitations, there are like, all kinds of resource limitations and, uh, and, and reasons why we have to focus on a specific element. But even then, that doesn't mean that we can't forget that we're working in a broader systems framework. And I'll just give you one example of that. And it's around private wells. And the private wells used all around the world, and they are very rarely under government oversight in any way, shape, or form. And so really, the stewardship and the health and well-being of individuals using those wells comes down to that individual or that household. And so if we think about it from a couple of systems framework, then um, no, we have that natural environment, right? We have the precipitation and temperature that affects not only the um, pathogens and their longevity, their survivability, their infectivity, but it also affects the pathways by which wells can be contaminated. And we have a hydrogeological system where we can either be having um, pathogens and, and water flowing in the surface, the subsurface, or it's finding preferential really fast pathways down from the surface into the ground. And then of course the ground can't act and use its natural filtration to uh, take out some of those pathogens and prevent them from getting into our well. But this is where we start moving into this coupled system because we start getting human decisions coming in about where that well's located, what type of well is put there, um, the casing, all kinds of elements of design that start coming in that actually have an impact on some of the um, potential contamination of that well. But we also then have the people who are using it, as I say, their attitudes, their risk perceptions, their knowledge. Um, do they test the well regularly? Do they maintain the well? Do they just leave it to crack and crumble? Uh, all of these start, think, start coming in on whether the well will be contaminated and maybe not even whether the well will be contaminated, but whether the water that comes through um, is treated before it gets to us and whether we add levels of protection in terms of being exposed. And so you can start seeing um, that maintenance, the treatment and uh, the uses. Some people have wells and they don't drink from them. They use alternate drinking water sources and use their well water for other things. Uh, some people don't uh, use well water for babies and infants. Some people use well water for everything. Uh, some people prefer well water to anything else they can use. And so this is where I'm saying about those knowledge, attitudes, and practices, those perceptions in the same way that they uh, might affect whether people treat water, whether they're looking at surface water and it's clear, it's clean, it's dirty. Um, we have the same types of attitudes and, and knowledge and practices and perceptions that come in that then affect whether we're exposed to contaminated water and how we're exposed and then what that means in terms of getting sick. And so, again, if I take that one step further and start thinking about those let the, those levers, those critical entry points, then we could we could look at it on the physical side, on that natural system side. And we could look at uh, the pathogen sources and trying to prevent those pathogen sources from getting into the groundwater, into the wells. We could look at the well type and construction. Um, we could look at people's behavior and their knowledge. Right? We could start looking at testing behaviors and trying to work on testing behaviors versus source water protection. Maybe we need both. And so, you know, there are also different risk profiles. And so is it a physical intervention? Is it a behavior intervention? The point is that at some point they come together to some kind of informed action. And it's that informed action that actually ends up improving human environment health. And so this is why I'd just like us to start thinking about, as I say, the different places that we can intervene, either in that, that water system or in the human system, or, uh, and, or both, 
and then what it means in terms of those those levers and those interventions, but also how we bring people together. And the risk profiles are really the sort of jumping off point then. I came from WASH uh, into this local water security and, and looking at coupled systems and the, the leverage points and, and being able to sort of think about it because, and I've really only talked about sort of the water and water quality affecting people, but the reality is that then people forget, uh, affect the water system uh, in terms of if we drill too many wells and we don't abandon them properly and we just leave them, then we've actually put direct tube straws down into the groundwater through which contaminated water can flow. And uh, if we're protecting ourselves from floods, we might put a, a floodgate above a city, but then that impacts the flooding of communities and or farmlands upstream. And so as people, as, as a human system, we also then have impacts on that, that water system, on that natural system. And so we can't forget the, the the um, feedback loops between the two. But as I say, these risk profiles, that starts getting us towards intersectionality, which is the last thought I want to, to leave you with today. And for those of you who don't know, intersectionality, it's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a black lawyer uh, in the United States. And uh, we've sort of, paraphrased intersectionality to be a considering the different ways that power structures influence opportunities and experiences when people hold multiple intersecting identities. And it's that intersection, <laughs> intersectionality gives it away a little bit. It's that intersection that becomes critical because we recognize and we talk about and we measure a, and, and we, we try and understand individual equity deserving groups. What Kimberly Crenshaw identified was this intersection between multiple um, identities. And it was a case of a black woman who was asking for, uh, who was um, claiming that she had been discriminated against in by a company who refused her employment. And the company's response was that they hire black men in their factory and they hire white women in their office. And so as a black woman, she was not a black man who could work in the factory and she was not a white woman who could work in the office. And so that intersectionality became really, really important. And so uh, Thompson talks about it being a method for understanding the complexities of, of social experience. But I want us to sort of unpack it a little bit more. This is the uh, definition by the Center for Intersectional Justice, and it's about fighting discrimination within discrimination and the inequalities within inequalities and protecting the minorities within minorities. And so you see these, uh, if you think of it as a Venn diagram, it would be the bit in the middle um, of every one of us. And so myself, for example, I am privileged, I am white, I am in a university setting, I have a, a an income, I have a, uh, a, a solid employment, right? I, I don't have to worry about my employment status. Uh, however, I'm also a woman and I'm an immigrant to Canada, but I'm also English speaking. And so we start seeing how these different identities can confer privilege or oppression depending on the groups and, and the identities that you hold. And so when we start thinking about this uh, gender, age, able, uh, ability, um, uh, ethnicity as part of water and the water landscape, what do we know? Well, we know from a natural perspective that water is not evenly distributed within countries or around the world, right? Our precipitation events, uh, the amount of water that one place gets over another is not evenly distributed. Water infrastructure is not an access and not evenly distributed within Canada, within the US. I don't know how many of you have heard of plumbing poverty. Um, certainly the uh, First Nation communities and long-term drinking water advisories here in Canada um, let alone then going to low and middle income countries and uh, the, the rural context versus the urban context. 
threats from water quality and quantity and not evenly distributed, again, comes down to environmental racism in many ways. Um, the co-location of um, detrimental, environmentally detrimental entities, uh, rubbish dumps, uh, chemical plants next to low income uh, communities or um, equity deserving groups. The fact that solutions don't benefit everyone equally. Um, there's a flip side to this. And this is why we shouldn't just be, you know, it's not just a moral imperative. There are, there are huge benefits to us to think about equity and diversity in water. And that is that diversity fosters innovation because suddenly we start getting multiple perspectives around a table and multiple perspectives mean better solutions um, and solutions that are more likely to be appropriate for everybody. And so that sustainable solutions piece also comes out of that diversity and bringing diverse voices around a table for conversations and for action. And so if we think about it, and I'm throwing climate change in here as well a little bit, but this is from a, a recent paper around equity, diversity and inclusion in large water research networks. And so if we think about you know, climate change threatening the predictability, availability, quality of water around the world, um, but then, as I say, the water resources, they're the product of this interaction between the natural and human system. This is that coupled human systems approach. But then let's start putting intersectionality on top of it, because then we start thinking about people's identities and what that means in terms of how they experience water access, how they experience uh, extremes in water, how they experience floods and droughts. We can have a flood event and not everybody's affected by that flood event. And even those people who are affected are going to be affected in very different ways. And some of that's about individual uh, human agency. Uh, some of that's sort of further up into these, these other concentric circles in terms of the systemic factors that either facilitate or, or mitigate these inequities. And then those political systems, right, the higher level governance, and that's national and international uh, in terms of the those, those broader mechanisms that are acting to either um, perpetuate the inequities or to, to try and uh, reduce them or eliminate them. And so what does that look like? Well, my journey into intersectionality really started with women and it started because of the conversations and the, the information, the knowledge that was um, being gathered to the research that we were doing. And you know, when we put it in context, um, the majority of the poor around the world are women. Uh, women have a high proportion of women are illiterate, uh, disempowered, therefore uh, reliance on public services and lack of access to and control over financial resources, especially when we think about white supremacy and patriarchal societies. Um, we also know that women have the, the burden, right, and the, the onus for, uh, for water fetching, for caregiving, and for managing domestic use in many low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa. Um, we also know that many indigenous women are the protectors of water in, across multiple uh, indigenous, um, indigenous peoples. But this also means then that they're vulnerable. Uh, vulnerable to bribes and sexual favors, uh, less likely to have sexual favors or to be held to sexual favors if there are women in the positions in the um, water tariff offices, right, or in the, the water treatment structures. So this isn't just about women in communities, it's about women in the jobs, in water jobs, women in technology, um, and other equity deserving groups as well because what we're seeing at the end is that there's insufficient participation in solutions and there's a an additional burden in terms of increased morbidity and mortality on women and other equity deserving groups because of these inequities and because of this insufficient participation in solutions. <clears throat> 
if we take it from from women to sort of this this broader multiple identity perspective, then if we think about it, it's lower middle versus high income, rural versus urban, ability, age, sex and gender, socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity and culture. And as I said, it's not just about the water availability, quality access, uh, who fetches water where it needs to be fetched, um, but it's about access to ecosystem services. It's the values that are placed on ecosystem services. Um, Water-related disasters, I've already talked about that. Something that's come up in some of our research has been around the fact that women have not gone to emergency evacuation shelters because their needs haven't been catered for in terms of sanitation facilities and also safety. Think about the fact that when families are uh, dispersed in an emergency and they're going to different places and women are not necessarily with their family, then they don't necessarily have the protectors of their family with them. And so some of these, even just thinking about emergency shelter design, and have we catered to the safety of minority groups? I'm talking about gender, um, a lot of, of binary gender, but I want to, again, raise awareness of non-binary as well. A lot of the work that I do in Africa, um, it's appropriate to only talk about it's safe. It's not safe for people if I start asking people and talking about non-binary, but in countries like Canada, United States, um, it, we should be talking about and recognizing the needs of non-binary individuals. It's it's really important. It's a, a huge gap in, uh, in the, the work that we do around water sanitation and hygiene, and particularly menstrual hygiene. And so again, it's about water sector employment and it's about water management and governance as well. And we see this, the World Health Organization and UNICEF have shown us this, they've shown us behind the numbers in many of their joint monitoring program reports. But I just want to sort of say, okay, this is urban and rural versus wealth. Um, and, and there's a regional piece, but this here is the subnational regions where suddenly you've got, you know, 24% of people with, with access to drinking water. But what about the rural people in Alto Paraguay? What about the women? in Alto Paraguay, right? What about those who are living with disabilities in Alto Paraguay? That's the intersectionality, right? These are still to some extent one dimensional, um, but what happens when we start digging in even to these sort of inequities um, in the single dimensions? What will we start finding? I'm going to finish up just with um, a case study that we've been doing through a, a PhD, um, Jervin Apatinga and his work in Ghana. And so we started with this coupled systems sort of intersectional um, framework and starting to think about what the drivers of water and accessibility are. And they're environmental, that's the natural system, uh, they're social, um, that's the human system. But then if we start putting that intersectionality lens on, they're systemic, um, but there are also then individual factors and obviously consequences, um, but coping strategies that people implement to mediate those consequences. We undertook a literature review for Africa and were able to start putting some of the factors under that that have been explored in the literature. And so climate change, extremes, pollution, uh, the terrain that people have to uh, navigate, seasonality and distance, some of the economic, the systemic factors, you can see the economic, political, social, cultural, again, tying in with some of the other um, pieces. And I'm sure with a lot of your research and or lived experience and or the challenges and barriers that you've come across in the, in the work that you do uh, and implementation and practice. And then the age, agency and power and social capital and health and, and status and, as I say, the other identities. And we found that there are coping strategies and there are consequences that are identified. So we then took that into Ghana as a country and into some of the, into our particular rural remote community up near Navrongo in northern Ghana, for those of you who might be familiar. And we start seeing some of the actual coping strategies. 
around managing within current means. So uh, treating and storing, um, reducing water use. So particularly women identified that they use less for bathing, uh, for washing and cooking. They postponed bathing um, and they also sort of relied on, on faith and, and resilience. Um, in terms of augmenting water supplies, they'd use alternate water sources. They'd dig a borehole. Um, they'd uh, some would purchase water. Uh, there was also collaborative water sharing within social networks, either families or friend networks, and that was primarily for drinking water. Uh, to a lesser extent for cooking, but people would go and borrow water for um, for that. Uh, there was also an advocating for change, a social action, collective financial contributions for maintenance, community well digging expressing complaints to other people. And a lot of the women engaged in this, even though they weren't involved in decision-making in the community, because we did ask about the, the power differentials. And so you can see uh, just some of the quotes from the, the focus groups that came out as well around the, um, our children will cry if we don't feed them, so we don't bathe them and we feed them. And uh, a man talking about digging wells and making sure that the maintenance uh, as part of that collective. And so if we tie it all together, then what it means is that, again, we've got sort of changes in the amount and timing of precipitation. We end up with insufficient water, or if we have too much damaged infrastructure, contaminated water, um, but it's the distance and the terrain and the compromise safety, um, as well as the health outcomes that start coming through. And again, if we start looking with intersectional lens, if we start looking from sort of the whole system, then we start identifying the connections between things. Um, the violence, um, I've done some work on, on violence before. We often think of it as being um, spousal violence, and that definitely comes out in terms of if a woman doesn't have time to cook um, because she's been fetching water for too long. But we also, what came out here was interpersonal violence at the water point between women who were having to wait and they knew that they were too far down the line to get water. And so again, it, it's, it's the leverage points, but it's also understanding what's going on and what's, um, what's associated with and what the consequences of a, a failing system is, and then how we leverage those in and through. And so we see that there are short-term coping strategies that can be maladaptive. We see this diversity and uh, the fact that we have to explicitly consider the diversity. Um, there are gaps in the literature, particularly around the gendered benefits of uh, wash infrastructure, the early warnings and disaster preparedness, and, uh, and this maladaptation space. But we can achieve systemic and transformative change. And how do we do that? Well, better data. But the only way to get better data is better research design. We need disaggregated data analysis, absolutely, but that means we have to have stratified sampling um, approaches because otherwise what we end up doing is that when, it, when we start doing the intersectional and disaggregated multidimensional approaches, our, uh, our N is so small, our sample size is so small that we can't derive any statistical information from it. And so we really need to, particularly large national surveys, and uh, they need to be thinking about this um, from a stratified sampling perspective. We need community-based participatory research approaches, the co-creation of research, um, so that we understand and we have that local input. Um, we need better knowledge mobilization. Uh, we need to start the engagement from the beginning of research design. And again, I'm talking about this from a research perspective, but there are take homes from a practice perspective, baseline assessments, uh, you know, understanding the community before designing the solutions, co-designing solutions. And so it's this knowledge, this information that's going to lead to better policies, programs, and practices. So perhaps think about the who, who's designing the data collection, Who's, who's being asked for data? Um, what's being asked? How is it being done? Why is it being done? There are all of these pieces that need to be brought in and equity deserving voices, equity deserving people, equity deserving representation needs to be in all of these spaces and all of these places and not just in one place. It's not good enough to say that we've collected data or you know our data represents equity deserving groups. They have to be part of the design 
they have to be part of the conversation, the analysis, and they have to be part of the solutions as well. So I hope I've given you a little bit of food for thought. And if anyone has any questions, then happy to answer them. Thank you ever so much.